It was only when Fa'a Pu'a began to speak that the size of the part she played in Mead's portrayal of Samoan sexuality became apparent. In other words, Margaret Mead had been hoodwinked. Coming of age in Samoa and all its evidence for the power of nurture over nature was based on the lies of Samoan girls. He said to me, Frank, you don't know what you've got here. You don't know how important this is that you've just filmed today. And he noted the day, you know, it was uh, November 1987. He said, this will go down in my diary as the most significant day in my life. Freeman immediately began work on a second book, based on Fa'a Pua's astonishing claim. A book he called The Fateful Hoaxing of Margaret Mead. Freeman thought that Mead was not simply hoaxed, but that she was fatefully hoaxed. It's almost as if she set herself up to be hoaxed because, according to Freeman, she didn't really understand the culture. She didn't speak the language that well. She wanted a certain outcome. I think D Derek thought that the second book would be the nail in the coffin, as it were. This, this would be the thing that, that finally did it. But unfortunately for Freeman, Mead's allies were once again lying in wait. Is it possible that Samoans will joke or have small lies about sex? Absolutely. They do it all the time. But generally, they do it with a kind of wink, which lets you in on the fact that they're joking and that everybody knows it. So the question is, would Margaret Mead have missed it if they had joked? And I don't know the answer to that. My intuitions tell me no, that she was too canny. Mead's supporters argued that she would obviously have realized that Fa'a Pua was, in fact, a Taupo or virgin. Being a Taupo, and Margaret Mead knew she was a Taupo, it was very unlikely that she would have thought that Fa'a Pua would have been engaging in the kinds of casual love affairs that she had heard about from other girls. And certainly she would have known that if she were in an affair, it, there was nothing casual about it because she would have been watched by her brothers, by the chiefs, etc., and under a kind of vigilance. Moreover, it was pointed out that Mead had got her information from girls other than Fa'a Pua, who anyway was the wrong age. Mead had already taken a sample of 25 adolescent girls from the three villages. Why she would need the opinion of a Taupo in her mid-twenties to tell her about adolescent girl sexuality is unclear. Yet again, Derek Freeman had run into a brick wall. After devoting more than 40 years of his life to discrediting Margaret Mead's coming of age. He was still no nearer to achieving his ambition. Instead, he remained out on a limb, vilified by the establishment he was so desperate to reform. I have always been a heretic, but what you've got to be in science is a heretic who gets it right. There's no use being a heretic who gets it wrong because then you're a pariah dog in their eyes. But if you are a heretic who gets it right, you can't do better. So is it possible, after all these years, 
to gauge who was right and who was wrong. Certainly, in the 80 years since Mead so powerfully argued the case for the influence of nurture over nature, only for Derek Freeman to refute it, anthropology has changed a great deal. No longer is it believed that human beings are the products of simply their biology or their environment. Instead, the old battle lines between nature and nurture have disappeared, to be replaced by a more all-encompassing approach. And yet, despite this newfound harmony, the Mead-Freeman controversy continues to divide anthropology like no other topic. On the one hand, Derek Freeman's supporters argue that he was a visionary, that by taking on a science which had become stale, he helped to move anthropology on. For those critics who say that the controversy was nothing but a media event, simply neglect this impact that his work actually did have. He really believed that he had set anthropology, you know, he set it on its feet, that it had lost its direction. On the other hand, there are those convinced that Freeman was a fanatic, whose only achievement was to tarnish the name of one of the greatest thinkers America has ever produced. I think one could say that one might feel sorry for Derek Freeman, really unbalanced and in the grip of an obsession, except for the fact that he was able to ride that obsession to his personal version of fame and to do an immense amount of damage. And it worked for him. He had fun. That's very clear that he had just great fun. He'd found his specialty. But from all the bitterness and rancor, one overriding question has emerged. How could two scientists have visited the same part of the world and come up with such different sets of results? Anthropologists, probably more than most people, are aware that in trying to describe a society, all understanding is to some extent positioned. And that's the word anthropologists use. And the picture that we get of a society, any society, is going to look different depending upon whose eyes we use to see it. In other words, more than almost any other science, anthropology is a subjective affair. Some scholars have understood the Mead-Freeman uh, controversy in terms of the Rashomon effect. That is Kurosawa's uh, film technique whereby he played a scene from four different angles with four different stories without any conclusion, allowing the viewer to decide for themselves uh, what the nature of truth was in this situation. And I think that's a possible way of understanding any ethnographic uh, description, knowing that it will be uh, told from a different vantage point if it's told from the viewpoint of men or women or a younger generation versus an older generation um, or during different historical periods. So given that anthropology can't be truly objective, perhaps the irony of the Mead-Freeman controversy is this that both its protagonists were right and wrong. I think Derek and Margaret were both looking uh, f for something they believed they could find, which was, a, was, which was the absolute truth about Samoa, whereas, of course, you know, what you get are different versions of Samoa. So like anthropology itself, with its new balance between nurture and nature, maybe the real Samoa is even more complex than Mead or Freeman portrayed both chaste and promiscuous, laid back and disciplinarian. In fact, a place much like anywhere else. Another tale from the jungle here on BBC4 next Monday at 9. Next up tonight, continuing the anthropology season, a gothic mystery and an Oscar-nominated piece of animation.